For the first part of the electricity and magnetism topic, we're going to be looking briefly at electrical fields. Um, this does tie in closely to a couple of other units, particularly the grade, um, sorry, grade uh, higher level unit on uh, fields, uh, which is topic 10. So if you're doing high level, you may have already have encountered some of the some of the concepts here. What's happening here? Well, um, you may recognize the situation. You might have uh, had to do this experiment. Uh, the girl has an electrical charge put on her. Uh, you can alternatively do a similar experiment using cats, but I suspect it's significantly more dangerous. What is an electrical field? Electrical field is a region of space where a charge experiences a force due to its charge. Whenever we're looking at electrical fields, think back to gravitational fields, because they're almost identical. If we have any mass, then it is surrounded by a volume of space, theoretically infinite in extent, though practically normally much smaller, for which uh, any ob smaller objects will be attracted due to its mass. Well, exactly the same feeling happens with an electrical field. An electrical charge will create around it a volume of space in which any other charge will experience a force. The only couple of differences between um, uh, mass and gravity and fields and charges is that every object has a mass of some kind, even if it's very small, whereas you have charges which have no charge and therefore they are unaffected by an electrical field. And also, of course, uh, mass only is you know, positive. It only has one um, direction, so to speak, whereas electrical charges can both positive and negative, and as a result, there are two forms of direction that can happen. Uh, they can be attracted to each other if they are oppositely charged or repelled if they are like charges, as is shown in the diagram here. So what is charge? Just to review this, um, charge is a property of material. Any material, any object, if you want to describe it, you have to describe its size, you have to describe its mass, you have to describe its colour, you have to describe its charge. Uh, charge has a symbol of Q, sometimes written as a large Q, sometimes written as a small Q, and sometimes written as both. As we've mentioned, it comes in positive and negative forms. It is conserved. Uh, the amount of charge in the universe is effectively constant. Um, and you can move charges around, but you can't create or destroy charge. And it has a unit, it is a measurable quantity, and the unit is the coulomb, measured in coulombs, which itself has the symbol a uppercase C. Um, when I say positive or negative, don't forget the other thing is it can have a value of zeros. And most objects you encounter in everyday life have an overall charge of zero, even if they are constructed from things which have positive and negative charges. A uh, coulomb is defined as the quantity of charge transported by a current of one amp in one second. It seems a bit odd that coulomb isn't an SI unit. Other fundamental properties, such as the kilogram as a unit of mass, are SI units. Coulomb isn't, and that's really because it's actually quite hard to measure. And it's much, much easier to measure current. So that is the SI unit, purely because it's much easier to measure and reproduce. And we calculate Coulomb in terms of current, as we'll see later. It actually makes much sen more sense from a conceptual point of view to define current in terms of charge. But officially, that's not how it's done. So the relationship between forces and charges comes about because of Coulomb's law, which is written here deliberately difficult. Uh, so that you can try and put some effort into reading it. Uh, I'll let you read that. Pause if you need to. Um, and that is put in an equation as F equals K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, where Q1 and Q2 are the charge in coulombs of the two components. R is the separation in meters. It's R squared, so it follows the inverse square law. And the force is proportional to the product of the charges. It's inversely proportional to the separation squared. And the constant of proportionality is known as K. K equals 9 times 10 to the 9 newtons per meter squared per coulomb squared. Now, that value is not itself actually, strictly speaking, constant because it does depend on the medium 
air or a vacuum or water or whatever through which the field is placed. That number assumes a vacuum. The um, value in air is very, very, very close to that. We can draw a charge by using field lines. And like with magnetic uh, gravitational fields, a field line shows what would happen to a small test charge in this case. Notably, a test positive charge. It's always the test charge is positive. So the arrow will be pointing away from the large charge if the large charge is positive. Arrows always point away from positive charges. Uh, the field strength is given by the density, so you can see in this field, the field strength, the um, number of newtons per coulomb, is going to be much larger nearer to the object than it is further away. If we have two objects of opposite charges, then you'll have a pattern like this. As I said earlier, the arrows always point away from the positive and towards the negative. Between them, there'll be a straight line. As you move away in a two-dimensional plane, it gets a little bit more complicated. But if you put a small test mass, uh, this is, by the way, equal opposite charges, plus 2 coulombs, minus 2 coulombs, for example, then a small test charge will be repelled by the positive in a radial way, straight away. But as it moves away, it'll be increasingly attracted by the negative, so it'll curve over until it hits the negative. Two point charges of identical charges, Positive or negative would change the direction of the arrows, but it wouldn't change the shape of the field. Notice how between the two points, equidistant, it is being repelled or attracted to both, and it will be in an equilibrium position. Although this is an unstable equilibrium, any deviation from exactly being in the middle means that one charge will be exert a greater force than the other, and it will, uh, it will push it, will pull it. Parallel plates is an interesting situation. Uh, in a gravitational field, you only could approximate towards straight lines. For example, if you looked at the gravitational field in a room, then approximately it would always be pointing straight down. In an electrical field, there's no need for that because it really is a straight line. As long as you have parallel plates um, with equally distributed charge on either plate, then there will be parallel lines showing you the direction that an object would move in. Any Anywhere in this area, a small test positive charge will go straight up to the negative. Do notice that your parallel plates are not infinite, and therefore there is this sort of curved end effect, as it's called. Um, the lines show what will happen to a stationary charge if it's actually just injected, but that's not a very real-life situation. More commonly, you do have parallel plates. In this case, the arrow would be pointing down. Uh, and then you have an, a charged object entering with a velocity. In this case, the charged object is an electron, and an electron has negative charge. So the arrow would be pointing down, because that describes what would happen to a positive charge, but the actual charge will be attracted towards the positive side. It will go up. Electric field strength, we mentioned earlier. Electric field strength is the force per unit charge, uh, in other words, the newtons per coulomb. So E equals F over Q, newtons per coulomb. Close to a spherical charge is given by this equation. It's proportional to F divided by Q, and F equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared, as we've seen. So E equals K Q over R squared. Okay, which is dividing by 1 Q. For parallel plates, it's a little bit more complicated to calculate what the value is, so we just basically use it as the definition uh, for a uniform field, it will be the same everywhere in the field. So it doesn't matter where you are in that field, F, to turn this around, will equal EQ. So E is constant everywhere inside the field. Finally, I believe, field strength is a vector quantity and as such is subject to vector addition. Now, any examples of this you're given in the exams should theoretically just be in a straight line connecting the points. Okay, So it's just a question of determining relative to the charges the um, using the distance from one and the distance from another, and, uh, the relative strengths, and then just finding the largest and then subtracting the smaller ones. Theoretically, however, you, may, you might be, you shouldn't be, but you might be asked about points that are not along that line, and there you'll have to use some form of vector addition. Again, you just calculate the electrical field strength due to each of the charges, 
and then use vector addition to find the resultant field strength. For example, here, E2 and E1, E3 and E4. The resultant field here is towards the left, because that's the bigger one. The resultant field here, redraw the vectors, either put that one on the end of that one, or put that one on the end of that one, and you'll get down this red line here. Worked example, again, straight line, which is what you should be getting with distances, non-SI, and charges given. There's the equation. Plug in the numbers, K, Qs. Plug in the numbers. This is the charge due to A. This is the, the field strength due to B. So the resultant one is 1 minus the other. And there is your answer. Follow it through again if you need another go. Okay, and that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much.